course, it starts out there where it says in Matthew 23, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees seat, sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do ye not after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. And of course, these are, uh, Jesus goes on here and starts to condemn them and rebuke them. And one of the things that he calls them, out of the many names that Jesus calls uh, these scribes and these Pharisees, one of them that he, that he uh, emphasizes is he calls them hypocrites. And we see here why he would call somebody a hypocrite. In fact, the definition of it, where it says there uh, in verse 3, uh, but do you not after their works, for they say and do not. And that's really the definition of a hypocrite, someone who says you should or should not do something, and then they themselves are guilty of doing or not doing that thing that they uh, uh, teach you not to do. And this was something that they were very uh, 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 bad about, and it's something that Jesus uh, calls them on. And you have to remember who the Pharisees and the scribes were. They were the spiritual leadership of that day. They were those that the people were looking to for spiritual guidance. I mean, he says they sit in Moses' seat. You know, they were uh, to be teaching and preaching the law of God, and they were hypocrites. They were a lot of other things. They were, they were very bad leaders. And really, we can learn about, a lot about leadership when we look at the scribes and Pharisees, uh, Pharisees about what makes good leadership and what makes bad leadership. You see, good leadership is somebody who's going to lead by example. I mean, that's really probably what made them, uh, you know, were very bad leaders, is the fact that they would not lead by example. They would say but they would do not. They would say, oh yeah, you should do this, you should do that, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, but they themselves would not do those things. They would not lead by example. And really, the best way to be a leader, whether it's in uh, you know, a place of work, whether it's in the church, or whether it's in your home, or whatever place where leadership is needed and you're filling that role, uh, the best way to get people to follow you is to be an example, to actually show them how to do those things. Not just tell somebody how to do something, but actually... Take the time to show them by your example. You know, people will follow what you do more than what you say. So if we're telling people to do this and do that, but we're not doing it ourselves, you know, we could say it till we're the blue in the face, but at the end of the day, you know, they're, they're likely to not do that. They're likely to not follow what we say, but rather um, what, we, what we do. So leader, good leadership isn't just saying, it's also doing. And really that's something that's wanting a lot today in America, especially in Baptist churches and, and Baptist pulpits. I mean, we have a lot of uh, strong, charismatic people who, who likely know the, the Word of God well and are trying to do the best that they can, but there's certain areas where they're really failing. You know, they're failing to lead by example in the area of, let's say, soul winning. I mean, that's a major word. I mean, why is it that soul winning is being left uh, undone by and large? It's because there's nobody doing it. I mean, why is it that nobody's doing it? It's because there's nobody leading them to do it. Yeah. It's because there's nobody showing them the example of going out and knocking the doors consistently, week in, week out, year in, year out, and getting the work of God done. And people are not very likely to go and do that on their own. To become motive, so motivated on their own, just if they're not in a good church, or they're, they're in a church where the soul winning is not emphasized, where the leader himself is not excited about soul winning, you know, that's not going to get done. And that's why it's not getting done today in America. That's why there's so many doors that are being left unknocked. It's because we don't have leadership in that area showing people how to get it done. So thank God for a church that, that we're a part of that has a good leadership, that has strong leadership, that, that has the, the right emphasis on soul winning you know, and going out and accomplishing that great work. I mean, that's a big vision yeah. that Faithful Word has to knock every door in Phoenix, to knock every door here in Tucson, to knock every door at every Indian reservation, to knock every door on, uh, you know, in the state of Arizona, you know, and yeah, even the world. I mean, that's, that's a huge uh, task, but it's doable. And it's something that we have to plan to do, you know, and, I, and I'm out there knocking doors today and I'm thinking, you know, well, about the leadership in this church, you know, uh, if, if, whether it becomes, you know, myself one day becoming the pastor here or another man that we don't even know about coming along and being the pastor or perhaps even somebody in this room rising up through the ranks of becoming a leader. I hope that whoever is behind this pulpit will always set that example that needs to be set and be that good leader of soul winning. Amen. Going out and reaching souls and knocking doors that if anything else slips, if anything else can kind of go by the wayside, but if they would just make sure that they keep that one thing in mind, that, that winning souls is what we're about, that we need to do. They can let and whatever you know part of the ministry uh, you know, maybe they maybe they don't they're not they don't you know care so much about the chairs. 
you know. Maybe they're not, they, maybe they don't keep the water nice and cold. Maybe they're not as good leader in some other area, but if they're putting it, the emphasis where it needs to be and being a good leader where it matters, right. Right. you know, whoever that person is, I hope that that's always the goal that we have in this church. And so we see that good leadership, they don't just say, they do. They show the example of how to do things. And good leadership, you know, they, 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 don't, uh, they don't pass the buck. You know, they don't pass the burden on. I mean, that's what Jesus is explaining was so bad about these Pharisees here. He's saying they bind heavy burdens, grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. I mean, they'll put the burden of, of, of work on everybody else. They'll say everybody else needs to do this, but they're just going to sit back and just enjoy not doing anything. They're just going to rest on their laurels. They're just going to take it easy. They're not going to get in there and get in the work and help bear that burden. So good leadership bears the burden along with with people. I mean, isn't that the example of Jesus Christ that we see throughout all the book of Matthew thus far? Yep. You know, he's not just telling them go and preach. You know, he, he, he's telling them to go where he, whither he himself also would come. He also was going to every city and village and into the mountains and, and preaching and doing all these things and doing the work right alongside his disciples. Yeah. So that's what makes good leadership. Not just saying, you know, not just pontificating, not just, you know, giving lip service to the work, but actually getting in there bearing the burden, and doing the work also. And, you know, at this point, before we kind of move on from this section, is, is one last thing I kind of want to say that is that bad leadership, let's say we have bad leadership. Let's say we're not in a church that is everything it should be. Or maybe we're, you know, listening to a preacher that's not exactly down the line uh, as he ought to be. Or maybe he is a little bit of a hypocrite in some areas. Or maybe he, uh, you know, is falling short in some area that, that he shouldn't be. Um, let me just say this, that bad leadership doesn't nullify the message. You know, just because a, a, a preacher gets up and says this, if he's preaching the word of God and saying, thus saith the Lord, regardless of his character, regardless of what he's like, that does not nullify uh, the message that's being preached. And people should understand that because here's the thing. I don't care who the leader is. You know, if you want to find fault in them, it's not gonna, you're not going to have to look very far. And if you want to find something wrong with me, you know, my appearance alone, right? You just, just looking up there, right? I don't even have to open my mouth a lot of times. You know, it's it's. But here's the thing, you know, that you don't have to look very far to find fault in Corbin Russell, you know. And here's the thing: sometimes people go into a church or they get under leadership and they get bitter about things, so that something rubs them the wrong way. So what they start to do is they start to nitpick at the leader, mm. and what they're really trying to do is giving them an excuse and sound spiritual to disregard the word of God, or they want to disregard church. They want to get out from underneath. Uh, you know, serving God, and what the way they'll do it is they'll they'll attack the leadership. They'll say, "Well, there's something wrong with that guy. Therefore, I can't trust what's being said." So just keep that in mind always. You know that that bad leadership doesn't necessarily nullify the message that they're preaching. If the message that they're preaching, if what they're giving you is biblical, if it's correct, if it's thus saith the Lord, it really. I mean, it, at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter what that guy's like. Yeah. You know, if he's saying what's he now? He should he be everything? That you should be, yes, absolutely. But again, we're human. If you want to find fault, you're not going to have to look very far. But look here in verse 5 where it says, But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. So another thing that we see about leadership that can be bad is that they have the wrong motives. You know, good leadership has the right motives. And it's not to enlarge their phylacteries. It's not to make wide the borders of their garments and to sit at the upper room of the feast. You know, they're not looking for the position of prestige and, and, and high calling and power. They're in it for the right reasons. These guys are in it for the wrong reasons. They want it to be seen of men and to be called of men, rabbi, ra rabbi. And that's what it says in verse, in verse 5, for all their works, everything that they're doing, everything that they're motivated to do, why they're in that position is to be seen of men. And, you know, this still goes on today. You know, it goes on not, you know, in every, in every uh, you know, uh, sect of Christianity, whatever you want to call it, every denomination, there's, there's an element of this. Where, and even in our own personal lives, this is an attitude that can creep in. Maybe not to the degree where, you know, we're going to walk in wearing a robe, carrying a scepter, you know, and sit right down up front, you know, and have a footstool, you know, and, and just expect all the, you know, maybe not that. But this type of an attitude can creep in even to our own hearts where we're doing things to be seen of men. You know, we're, 
we're trying to, you know, come across more spiritual than we really are. And we have to really go, be on guard about that. That's not something that we want creeping into our life because it can lead you down a very bad path. But these guys, I mean, they make no bones about it. I mean, they're, everything that they're motivated to do is, is, so, is so that they can receive glory of men. They have the completely wrong motives here. You know, and uh, le good leadership has the right motives. And it goes on, a verse says there, be, be not called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ. So right here we see that rabbi means master, right? Be ye not called rabbi, why? For one is your master. I mean, that is what rabbi means, master. And ye are all brethren, and call no man father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called master, for one is your master, even Christ. So we are not to be called masters, and we are not to be called father. Neither are we to call other men masters, right. and neither are we to call other men father. Right. Now, obviously, if you have a dad, which, you know, we all do, you know, it's okay to call him father, right? That's not, but he's not saying, he's saying don't call other men masters, don't call other men fathers, and, and, and to uh, subject yourself to them in that that's way, right. to lift them up and, and puff them up in that way. Because a lot of guys, that's what they get into it for. They want to hear master. They want to hear father. You know, they want to wear the robe. They want to sit... You know, they want to be seen of men. They yeah. want to be in the giant cathedral. They want to, you know, they want to be broadcast to the world. Yeah. You know, they want to, they want to, everyone to be looking yeah. at them. And, you know, we could, we could go uh, down different avenues with this, but one would be, you know, uh, the masters, uh, the, the rebuking people who would call themselves master. What, where do we see that today? You know, in the world, in, in the collegiate, or the world of higher education. Yeah. Where people are receiving these different degrees. And especially when it comes to, um, you know, specifically theology. People go to these seminaries and things, and they receive titles that go completely against. I mean, is, is there any question about what Jesus is saying here? There's this vague statement he's saying, be not called masters. Right. Don't do it. I mean, it's that plain and simple. But yet, you'll still have people who call themselves Christians who will go to a college, they'll go to a seminary, they'll go through training to receive a master's degree. Yep. You know, and I, and I hear them all the time, and they'll, and they'll get these things called masters of divinity yep the master of divinity the master master of that which is divine you know the master of god the masters of divinity they'll get the masters of uh masters of theology you know they, they get these different things it, 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 and they have they want to be called masters yep. they'll get a plaque they'll hang it on their wall yep. master right and they're going to put phd they're going to get their doctorate and you're going to call them by that you're going to say i'm a doctor you know i'm a master and you know what? I'm not going to call you that. Right. I don't care what, how long you spend in school. I don't care how many tens of thousand dollars you forked out. I'm not interested in calling you master because I'm told right here not to call you master. Amen. It says, you know, uh, not to be called master. Don't call people master divinity, master of theology. Go ahead and turn over to First John chapter two. First John chapter two. You know, the men that I've learned the most Bible from, uh, frankly, didn't even go to Bible college. Didn't graduate from Bible college. Amen. The man that I've uh, learned the most Bible from, Pastor Anderson, other preachers, even men that I just know in my personal life, friends of mine, you know, that just read their Bibles, it, it's, you know, they didn't have to go get some degree somewhere to gain that knowledge. That was something that God gave them through their own diligent study, through their own, uh, you know, just being in the Word of God, and through being led of the Holy Ghost. You know, we don't need these people to tell us whether or not we're qualified to preach and teach the Bible. Amen. You know, uh, we don't need people to put their stamp of approval upon us from some higher learning. I'm not saying we don't have to have qualifications to be pastors and, and deacons and things. Of course, those qualifications are there, but we don't have to have other people, you know, uh, put their stamp of approval from an outside source saying, well, you, you know, you never, you never graduated from Bible college. That's like a big critique that some people have of, of pastors in this movement. Right. Well, did you go to Bible college? And some of you don't, I'm, I'm sorry, but Bible college is ruining people. I mean, I've seen uh, Bible colleges have sent out heretics. That happens all the time. I mean, they send out, they've got perverts in these places, yeah. quite frankly. You know, these people that are getting busted just doing the most weirdest, perverse things, and they're propping them up in leadership in these Bible colleges. And these Bible colleges say they're a joke. It, and it's not biblical. You know, let me just say it. You know, I don't believe in Bible college. Right. I'll never yeah. go to one. I'll never recommend somebody goes to one. Amen. Because it's a joke. You know, I, I, I'm... Even in my own personal life, I could tell you about pastor people who were sent out to go be pastors by a Bible college. We're not married, had I mean, obviously, and therefore did not have kids. Obviously, they weren't even married, and this Bible college is saying go pastor. 
Go be a pastor to these people now. And they're just more than happy to go do it because their Bible college told them to do it. They'll say, well, what authority do you stand on? My Bible college. You know, not, not the Word of God, not the clear teachings of the Word of God that say, you know, uh, that, you know, the bishop must be the husband of one wife. Right. You know, having his children in subjection, you know, children, plural. But that's the problem with Bible colleges is people lift these men up in these Bible colleges and they put so much, uh, you know, just authority behind them that it over supersedes the Word of God. You know, and that's happened. I, you know, another one that people that get sent out, well, their Bible college, they go start, go, go pastor this church, no kids. Doesn't meet the qualifications. But the Bible college, it's okay. You know, that, and I'm sorry, I just don't go for it. It's, it's not right. Amen. You know, the Bible says, you're there in First John, and it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you? Or letters of commendation from you? I mean, if Paul's saying, look, do, do I not have authority? I mean, the people that are questioning his authority, he's saying, what makes you think I need to have, you know, com letters of commendation from you? You know, it says, are you not our epistles known and read of all men? Uh, you know, they, they knew well the authority that he had simply yeah. because of the, the fact that his preaching was in word and power. You know, and quite frankly, a lot of these guys that come out of Bible colleges, it's weak. They, they don't have, they don't, there is no power. Right. It's, it's weak. And here's the thing. It says there in 1 John 2, verse 27, But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you, but it has the same anointing teacheth you of all things and is truth and is no lie. And even as it, as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. He's saying right there that you need not any man that teacheth you, but the anointing that you receive, that, but the, as, as the same anointing teacheth you all things. Right. You know, we have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. If we're saved, if we're born again, and we have the Spirit of God dwelling in us, and we're walking in truth, and we're walking in the Spirit, and we're reading the Word of God, you know, God's going to teach us things. And, and I'll say this, there's nothing you can't learn from the Word of God on your own. Amen. You can learn all of it. Now, it helps to be in a church under somebody else who's learned the Word of God because it accelerates your learning. Right. You know, instead of having to take, you know, multiple reads through the Bible to glean certain things, you know, you can glean from other people's knowledge and study. There's been things that have just been passed down from generation to generation that are just known, proven facts from the Word of God, you know, doctrines and truths and, and principles that have just been handed down from generation to generation. And we get to stand upon that in the local church. We get the, the benefits and we get the privilege to sit there and to, and to glean those things from other men for generations uh, you know, behind us that have studied out those things and preached those things and taught those things. But here's the thing. There's nothing you, that's going to be taught from this pulpit or any other you know, a good godly pulpit that's going to, that you can't learn on your own, just through your own study. And is that not what it says there? Yep. It says right there that you need not that any man teach you. You don't need it. But it, that doesn't mean it isn't helpful. That doesn't mean it isn't, uh, you know, an, uh, a privilege and, a, and, a, and beneficial to you. Right. It's still something we should do and something we should glean from. But you don't need it. And I cer you certainly don't need to pack up your bags and go spend thousands of dollars and go to some strange part of the country and go live in a dorm room with a bunch of dudes or whatever and go to some college and, right. and have them give you a bunch of nonsense. Right. And probably teach you, th teach you things that aren't even true. You know, teach you the preacher of rapture. Yep. I don't know if they could even, I don't even know how you teach it. You know, or teach you dispensationalism. Yep. Or teach you just a bunch of garbage and false doctrine. So, you know, we don't need that any man should teach us. And we don't need, uh, you know, all of these different uh, just commendations that people are trying to give us. And really what it comes down to is that good leadership has, you know, as we said earlier, has the right motives. They're not in it to just be called of men. I don't know how I got down that rabbit trail of of Bible colleges and things, but we see that, you know, good leadership, they have the right motives. They're not there to be seen of men. They're not there to be called father. They're not there to be called master. They're not there to uh, receive the praise of men or to be seen of men. They're there for the right motives. And what is the right motive? You know, it's to serve others. And, and, and Jesus gets into that here a little bit as it goes on there. In verse 11, it says, But he that is greatest among you shall, you know, uh, shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Now, it's kind of that phrase there, you know, this is something a lot of people are familiar with. He that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Now, that, that, you have to ask yourself, does that mean I can be greatest by being the servant? Well, here's the thing. If your desire to, is to be the greatest, you know, you're probably already, uh, you're already started off on the wrong foot. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not really going to be a good servant because your motive is wrong. 
You know, the guy who's going to be the greatest, there's going to be people in heaven who are going to be exalted that, that their name was never mentioned down here. That people might not even know who they were. They might have even gone to church for decades and, and they were just, you know, they were just faithful, humble, meek people that just were faithful to the Lord when, and just did what they were supposed to do and they were blessings, you know, and they were servants to anybody. But their name was never, they were never exalted here. But here's the thing, they, they, they got there because they have the right motive. They didn't set out saying, well, I'm going to be the greatest, so I'll be sure that I'm servant of all. And people can get, adopt this attitude of thinking, well, I'm going to be the greatest, so I'm just going to make sure I'm just going to be the servant of all. And, and you know what? It, your motive is wrong right out of the gate. And that's going to show its face eventually. You know, it's going to show that you're really not in it to, to, to serve, but you're then in it to be exalted. You know, if your motive is to be exalted, it's not the right motive. But if your motive is truly to just serve and to be humble and to be meek and to just be used of God to whatever capacity he sees fit to use you, mark it down, you will be exalted. Right. Maybe not in this life, but in the next. And maybe even in, in, in this life and the next. And it says, whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. So if your motive going into being a servant is to be exalted, you know, to be the greatest, well, you're trying to exalt yourself by being a servant. Does this make sense? Yep. It's the wrong motive. And you can just mark it down. If you're serving with the wrong motive, you're going to be abased because your desire is to be exalted. And whosoever shall, uh, whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. You see, a, a true servant, you know, he, dis he displays certain attributes. He displays the opposite attributes of what we see here with the Pharisees. You know, he doesn't bind heavy burdens to, you know, to be born and, bind and put them upon men's shoulders. You know, he doesn't just pass the buck on everybody else. You know, a real servant, when they see a need, they just fill it. You know, they don't go, hey, this needs to get done. Well, that's somebody else's job. I'm just going to have so-and-so do that. You know, they just do it. They just do whatever needs to be done. That's what a servant does. They just see a need, and they fill a need. They're not sitting there just trying to delegate and say, well, that's, you know, just pass it off and say, well, that's somebody else's deal. I'm going to let somebody else take care of that. That's really not my area. You know, if you see something that needs to get done, just do it. And, and that's what a true servant will do. They'll see the need and they'll fill it. You know, whether it's, you know, something in the church or outside of the church. You know, you could take that principle with you throughout your whole life. And it, it'd probably benefit you a lot. I mean, take that, take that attitude on to the job and watch what it does for you. That, say, that says, well, I'm, I'm going to do whatever needs to be done. I'm not going to get this attitude that just says, well, you know, that's not my area. That was delegated to somebody else. I don't feel like that's my responsibility. Somebody, you know, they should do that. They made that mess. They should have to clean it up. Well, maybe that guy was a little busy. Maybe that guy had a lot of other things going on and it slipped his mind. And maybe you should just step up and, and, and take care of it. You know, and, and watch how that exalts you. Watch how that humble attitude of, of a right motive and then will, will, you know, of being a servant, you know, that's willing to do anything that needs to be done will exalt you. I mean, even in this world with your boss. You know, the boss isn't looking for the guy, isn't looking to promote the guy who's only willing to do certain things. So, well, that's outside the scope of my, of, you know, my job description. That's, you know, the, what's the one I always heard when I worked at the city? Uh, you know, that's above my pay grade. Well, you know what? It always will be, too, yeah. because that's your attitude. You'll never have that pay grade because you're not willing to do the work that people that pay grade deserve. So, you know, people have it totally backwards in the workforce today. They'll think, I'll, I'll work harder when they pay me more. That's not how it works. <laughs> you, know, you know, no employer goes to his employees and says, you know, this guy doesn't work very hard, but I bet if I paid him more, he would. <laughs> you think that's how an employer works? No. Not at all. They say, boy, that guy, I don't pay him as much as this other guy, but, man, he works just as hard. He's willing to do anything. You know, he's the first one in, the last one out, and he, he's making less. I'm going to promote that guy. I'm going to give that guy a raise. Not the guy who's just like, well, that's beneath me, or that's above me. That's outside my job description. You know, a true servant, you know, isn't just looking to pass the buck and bind the, the burden on other people and not move it with his own finger. He's willing to get in there and do the work. You know, he doesn't seek to be known and acknowledged like the Pharisees. They're not the servants of God. They're trying to exalt themselves. They don't want to do the work. They want other people to do it. That's not a true servant, and therefore they were abased. He goes on and says in verse 13, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Now notice right there, that, that's an exclamation point. You know, that, that, that's significant. I mean, Jesus is saying this emphatically. He's not just like, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. You know, you guys are hypocrites. And just gently, you know, let me just take you aside and gently remind you. You know, he's getting after them. 
and he's doing it publicly. He's not just, you know, um, taking him aside, having a sit down. And he starts to really lay it on him. He says, For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither, ye, for ye neither go in yourselves. I mean, that's some strong preaching. Just get up in front of everybody and say, You know what? You're damned. You're not even saved. Yep. You're on your way to hell. That's what Jesus preached. Neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. And that's kind of an interesting principle, isn't it? That these, he, he, what, this observation that Jesus makes, this statement where he says, You're not going in. And you don't suffer them that are entering to go in. So that's a characteristic of a reprobate false prophet, somebody who's preaching lies. A lot of time, these guys that are preaching lies are preaching a false salvation. They're preaching a works-based salvation. They're preaching a false gospel. A lot of times, you know, and you can come mark it down if they're in a place of influence, if they're a place where they're making a lot of money, yep. if they're gleaning, they're profiting from it. They know they're false prophets. Right. They know they're preaching lies. And you know what? They know they're not suffering other people to go in. They know full well, you know, I'm not going there, and neither are these people that are listening to me and following me. So here's the thing about false prophets, is that they seek to drag others down with them. They know they're not going to heaven. Right. They know they're not going to make it, these reprobates. I mean, you think about with the homos and things like that. You know, they, they the back of their minds, I don't care how much they say it. You know why they hate God so much? You know why these fags don't want to retain God in their knowledge? It's because they know they're going to hell. Amen. That's why they don't even want to think about God. Yeah. Because they know in the back of their minds, as it says, they just have a fearful looking for, uh, 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 for indignation that should devour the enemies. They're just afraid. Yeah. They're afraid of God. They don't want to think about what's coming in the next life. Amen. And you know what? They hate it so much that they, they'd rather just, and they want to make everybody else as miserable as them. Yeah. They want to drag others down with them. Right. They want to go out and defile others and pervert others and bring them along with them. That's what these people do. It says, and go ahead and turn over to 2 Peter uh, chapter 2. The Bible says in Romans 1, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death. You know, and, and read that chapter, friend, and talking about men with men, doing that which is unseemly and not convenient, women with women, which you, uh, leaving the natural use of the woman to do that which is against nature. It's talking about homos. It's talking about people doing perverse, wicked things that God has given them over to do because God has rejected them. Because they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. You know, he gave them over to a reprobate mind. Right? Yeah. And they know that they which commit such things are worthy of death. That's New Testament. Are worthy of death. Amen. Okay? Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Why do they have pleasure in them? Because they know they're taking somebody with them. Because they know they're dragging others down with them. That's the pleasure that they have in this. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people... Even as there shall be false prophets among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that hath bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Look at verse 17. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, uh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For whom a man is overcome is of the same, he is brought into bondage. Look, these people, they know where they're going. They know where, where, where they're headed. And they, they just want to bring other, they want to bring others down with them. They themselves are the servant of corruption. They promise liberty, but it's all a lie. Yep. They promise them liberty. Oh, you're free in Christ. You know, you, you know, uh, it's it, whatever. They just want to preach all these lies, but they know that they themselves are the servants of corruption. <clears throat> you see, false prophets, what's really scary about them is a lot of times they know exactly what they're doing. I mean, that's like the scariest thing, I think. Yeah. That's like the hardest thing to wrap my mind around sometimes when you think about these false prophets. Okay. They know what they're doing. Right. It's not just that they're being misled. It's not just that they had something wrong. It's that they know exactly who they, what, they are, what they are. They know who God is. They've rejected him. They know they're rejected, and they're just going to drag. Now, are there people that out there, false prophets, that don't know all that? Sure. But I think, by and large, a lot of them know exactly who they are. They know that they're the ministers of Satan. That's right. They know that they're serving the devil, uh, you know, the, and, and uh, they're, they're more than glad to do it. <clears throat> they know what they're doing. The Bible says in 2 Timothy, 
Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Not only are they deceived, but they're also doing the deceiving. These are what false prophets are like. They find solace, they find pleasure in destroying others. And that's why Jesus just comes down so hard on these people. Because these guys mark it down, they're false prophets. They're, they themselves are not going in, and they, would, they are preventing those that would enter in. They're false prophets. Look at verse 14. And Jesus just drops the hammer on them. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour wid widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. <clears throat> now, one thing I want to point about this is that the Pharisees are present to receive this. They're here, hearing these words come out of Jesus' mouth. You know, Jesus didn't pull back from hard preaching. Jesus wasn't afraid to just tell people how it is. Yep. You know, he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't sit there and worry about the consequences of what might happen. I mean, what happened to Jesus as a result of this? He got crucified. You know? But he, he knew that. He knew that's what was going to happen. But did that cause him to just say, well, I better, I better pull back a little bit? No. I better not go ahead and call them, you know, uh, what, what, you know hypocrites. And he goes on and calls them vipers. You know, and call, I better not call them unsaved and tell them that they're these wicked, false, reprobate, you know, false prophets. He didn't care about that. He did not worry about the consequences. He just preached what needed to be preached and let the chips were fall where they may. And that's whatever, however it turned out is how it turned out. Amen. And that's why we have to be with our preaching. You know, that's how we have to be with our stand on the word of God. You know, if the Bible says it, then it needs to be preached. That's right. And, you know, if people don't like it, tough. Yeah. It's what the Bible says. You know, and that's the problem we have today. Too many guys today that are worried about how it's going to be received. So many guys that are worried about how it's going to, you know, uh, might rub people the wrong way. You know, and our attitude ought to be, as, you know, I love the euphemism, if I'm rubbing the fur the wrong way, well, the cat can turn around. Because I'm not, you know, I'm not up here to make everybody feel good. Yeah. And that's, that's real preaching, where people are just going to get up and say what needs to be said, regardless of how it makes people feel. That's what needs to be said. And that's how Jesus preached. Jesus was not somebody who held back the message or only, let me just, let me just say this about the Pharisees in private. Let me just take my disciples aside and explain to them that they're hypocrites and that they're evil and that they're false prophets and that you know, they're all these wicked things. Let me just do that in private. He took it right to the Pharisees. He went right up to them in public in front of everybody and called them out. Yeah. And that's the type of preaching we need today. And unfortunately, there's very few men of God that are willing to do it anymore. You know, it's hard to even just find any preaching sometimes. Sometimes I'll hear about a Baptist preacher or some church somewhere. And I'll say, well, great, let me, let me go see what he's about. You can, I mean, you can go on there, you can read their doctrinal statement, which is all nice and friendly about how they, you know, they believe in the Trinity and they believe by salvation through grace, through faith, and they believe in separation of this. And they, they have their doctrinal statement is nice and neat and clean and unoffensive and there's nothing wrong with it. And boy, they've got this ministry right and they're doing this over here and everything looks good, but where's the preaching? Where? I can't find it because they want to do it all in private. Yeah. Because they want to just go in the back. They just want to do it all just, you know, just right here where everybody's on the same page. You know, they don't want to broadcast. I mean, they don't want to, they won't have the camera set up live streaming to, you know, to their 12 listeners. Right? <laughs> right. Like I am. Right? <laughs> they don't want to put it out there. You know, and, and really they're missing out. And they can't figure out why, you know, their churches are, are, are shriveling up in a lot of instances. You know, why is it that the new IP is reaching so many people? Because we're reaching, because we're putting it out there, you know. Because Pastor Anderson, you know, actually took the time to figure out how YouTube works, and it's not that hard, you know. If you start by pressing the record button, you know, and it goes and it goes on from there. And, and but these guys don't even want to do that. They don't want to put the preaching out there. And do you think they're not preaching some things that might get them in hot water? I, I dare say that a lot of them probably are. You know, even today during the Pride Month. I'm sure there's, they might not be saying everything that we say, you know, that they're worthy of death, and so on and so forth, but they're probably saying some things that if the homeless found out about, would get them in hot water. Because they're not, you know, they're saying, they're not saying, well, they're great, wonderful people. Yeah. But, they, but they're okay. They're, never, they're not going to be in the nightly news, you know, because they're, they're not going to preach it publicly. They're not going to, they're just going to keep it right here and uh, not put it out there. But that's what Jesus did. I mean, he, he wasn't just preaching his disciples. He wasn't just the church. I mean, he's out there ripping face in public on these guys. And that's what we need today. We need, and that's, because here's the thing, you know, if, if, when, if, if we would stand up as God's people and preach the whole counsel word of God unapologetically, 
And more preachers started doing that, more people would be emboldened to say, yeah, I believe that too. You think everybody just goes is going along with all the, with this homo agenda that we're having just shoved down our throats right now wow. in the month of June? Do you know how many people out there are seeing this crap on their TVs and, and everywhere else they look, and they're going home and they're just thinking, man, I can't stand it. It's sick. It's disgusting. Right. But they don't say anything about it. Yep. But if more men would stand up and just preach the word of God and, and say what they really believe about this, other people would be emboldened. Yeah. And these fags would go back in the closet where they belong. Yep. <clears throat> so, you know, Jesus was a hard preacher. He didn't pull back. Neither should we. We should just let it rip and, and, and not worry about the consequences. You know, the fair, and now we see that because Jesus is here present with the Pharisees and he's, he's addressing them directly. <laughs> You know, he's not doing that thing, you know, like, you know, some people here, I don't know if this applies to you. And he's like, no, you Pharisees, you hypocrites. He's calling them right out. And he doesn't pull, pull punches and he doesn't hide hard truths. And neither should we. And that's what we've been admonished to elsewhere in the book of Matthew, that, you know, uh, we, we are the light of the world. A city that set in hell cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it on a bushel, but on a candlestick and to give light to all that in the house. You know, that's how we're supposed to be. Not take our candle and hide it. Yeah. You know, well, maybe it's more discerning for us to put it under a bushel and not let others see it. You know, maybe we get more done with the light under the bushel. You don't know that. And you know what? If that's the way you think, that's your own reasoning. And you can't, you can't, you cannot lean on your own understanding and, ex and expect God to, to, to lead you. You know, you have to acknowledge God in all your ways and, and he shall direct thy paths. Now, there were some hard things that Jesus said, and they were interpretations were given in private, weren't they? There were instances when Jesus would preach and teach things to just those that were in his inner circle. But it wasn't hard preaching like this. It wasn't when he was ripping face and calling people out. It was when he was teaching things that were being hidden from them for the purpose of uh, them not being able to understand. And, you know, I, I really don't have a lot of time to go into all that. But the Bible's real clear that there were some things that the, these people would not understand. The Bible says in, in John 12, 40, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted and I should kneel. There's some people that God actually blinds their eyes and hardens their hearts. And so what we can glean from that is that, if, you know, if we understand these things, and if our hearts are not hardened, our eyes are open. You know, it's a real privilege to, to know and understand spiritual truth. Right. That's a real privilege that we have. The indwelling, to be saved, to have the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, to have the Word of God in your hand, and to be able to open up and, and read and know and understand what's written therein, that is a great privilege. Amen. Because there's some people in this world where God has actually blinded their minds and hardened their hearts. And, uh, you know, thank God that we're not one of them. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 13, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see and hear, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear, and have not heard them. You know, we're very privileged to have the whole word of God. We're very privileged to be able to open this up and understand what it says. Amen. Now, he continues on in verse 15, just ripping into the Pharisees. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him two more, twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Woe unto you, blind guides which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind. I mean, he's calling them fools. He's calling them blind. He's calling them hypocrites. For whether it's greater the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold. Look at verse 19. Ye fools and blind. I mean, just laying into them. <clears throat> and, you know, we, you know he just, he's getting after them about some of the stupid things that they were saying. I mean, when you read what, what it is that they were claiming, you can see why you call them a fool. And they're saying, whosoever shall swear, whoso shall swear by the temple and sweareth by it. Or excuse me, whosoever shall swear by the altar, sweareth. Uh, he's saying, for whether it's greater the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift. When you read that passage, it's like, don't they understand that the altar is greater you know, than the gold that's on it? You know, don't they understand that it's the one in heaven that matters, yeah. not the one on earth, you know, this, this physical object? Yeah. And he's calling them fools for their reasoning. And when you read it, you understand, man, these guys really are fools for thinking this. But that's the way unsaved people are. They come up with just these dumb ideas about who God is and, and, how, and all these things, how you know, the spiritual world works. He goes on in verse 23, Woe unto you, scribes and, and, and Pharisees, hypocrites, 
For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weighter matters of law of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These things ought you to have done, and to not to have left the other undone. So Jesus calls them out, he calls them names, he tells everybody what's wrong with them. And not only that, but Jesus specifically and publicly rebukes the, the specific sins that these guys are guilty of. And he gets he nails them right down to it. Saying, you know, you guys are paying tithe of, of of you know uh, of mint and, and cumin and anise, and you ought to have done that. He says, but you know what? You also forget left off this. You left off the weightier matters of the law, of mercy, faith, and judgment. So he rebukes them publicly, but he also gets really specific. You know, and it might be that if you're in a, a church that has strong leadership in it and that's going to follow the pattern that's given us in the Bible, that you might have to endure having other people's sins pointed out publicly. You know, there's times in a church where you know, and I pray that it never happens here. That we never have, if someone's life gets to the point where we have to say, hey, so-and-so is in sin. They're getting called out for it publicly and being dealt with, you know. And by publicly, I mean within these four walls. That's the extent of the publicity that's there. That, it doesn't extend beyond that. You know, there's been a lot of people that have gotten into sins that are worthy, according to 1 Corinthians 5. I mean, do people even understand this day that there are sins in 1 Corinthians 5 that will get you kicked out of church? Amen. Like, right. removed from fellowship. That's right. You know, and it lists it there. You know, drunkenness, covetousness, uh, you know, fornication. There's all these sins there. But it, let me say this. It's limited to those sins. You know, the church can't just start making up things to kick you out for. But there's been plenty of people I know in Phoenix that have been kicked out of church. But you know what? Well, it's only the people that are there in Phoenix that know about it. Because that's all the further it goes. And, and, uh, and here's the thing. You know, Pastor Anderson gets a lot of criticism. People say, well, you're always kicking people out, you know. But a lot of those people come back. Not always, but some of those, it's not like they're, they're out for good. You know, if they get it right, if they repent, and if they're truly sorry for what they've done, and they knock it off, they're welcome back into fellowship. But nobody ever sees that. You know, nobody ever sees that part of the ministry, uh, people coming back in, because we, we don't publicly announce that. You know, we just want to let everyone know, so brother so-and-so has gotten it right, and we're to forgive him now. He's back in fellowship. You know, so let's all forget about how he was running around, Drinking, smoking pot, and sleeping around. You know, I know he was doing that, you know, but we're going to forget about that right now. Okay, so everybody just forget about it right now. You know, that's not how it works. You just, you know, he's allowed back in the per for the, the person who's made the offense. You know, a lot of times just goes to the pastor one on one and he determines whether or not they're allowed to back in. And, you know, if they're there, they're there. And everybody just moves on. And it, it's great that it works that way because I've seen people come back in the church and I've totally forgotten that they were ever kicked out. It was like they were never gone. Because we didn't sit there and, and, and make a big deal out of it once they came back in. You know, so people, according to 1 Corinthians 5, can be kicked out of church. I pray to God it never happens, but let me just say this right now. If that ever happens, do not record it and put it up on YouTube. Right. Please don't do that. Right. <laughs> you know, people, Pastor Harris got a bunch of flack about that once. Somebody was getting kicked out, and somebody, I mean, welcome to the age of the smartphone. <laughs> Where you could just beep, boop and be recording. I mean, just quick, you know, within seconds, you could be recording, live streaming to the world. You know, the, the millions in the arena are watching. You know, as you're as you're kicking some heretic or whatever out. You know, and, and uh, so don't ever do that. And by the way, the people that that did that turned out to be weirdos themselves mm -hmm. and are no longer there. So that's a whole other story. But uh, <clears throat> now there are times when people are kicked out a little bit more publicly where it is becomes knowledge beyond the church walls, where those that are outsiders are observing it. I mean, we think of the heretics that got kicked out of our church up, in, up there in Phoenix. And why, why was it that, you know, Tyler Baker was kicked out and, and his name was uh, put out there publicly because he was in a public ministry. He was the deacon of a church. Right. Yeah, people knew who he was, even outside of the church. They were looking to him. He was, had influence. You know, and, and so people that are in a position that is public, you know, outside of the church, yeah, they need to be called out and dealt with publicly. But that's not for Joe church member. You know, that's not just for your, your, your the guy who's not, you know, in the leadership. He's just a faithful member, you know, he's just filling the pew. You know, he doesn't need to have his name put out there on YouTube. He doesn't need to be called out on Facebook and all these other ways that people can just spread it. So... <clears throat> There's, there's a lot more here, and I, I kind of want to get through the chapter here tonight. Um, jump down, down to verse, uh, verse 24. 
Because there's kind of something we, that we kind of I want to make sure we deal with in this chapter here. It says, Ye blind guides would strain a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make... I mean, how many times does he call them hypocrites in this chapter? I mean, I haven't bothered to count them, but it's a lot. A lot. He's after them. For you make clean the outside of the cup of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup, platter, cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. So what he's calling them on is the fact that they were very beautiful on the outside. They were very concerned about what was on the outside, the outside appearance, right? They had the broad, they made the, the, the they had the, the enlarged, the borders of their garments. You know, they made long pretense of uh, prayer for pretense. I mean, they were very outwardly, they appeared unto men to be very godly and holy and things like that. But inwardly, they were, you know, ravening wolves. They were full of dead men's bones. And a lot of people can say, well, take this and say, well, see, that just shows us that the outward appearance doesn't matter. You know, Jesus isn't concerned about the outward. You know, he's not concerned about the way we look. And that's true to a certain degree. But and they'll say, well, the outside doesn't matter. It's the inward that, that matters. Well, the in, inward matters more, I'll say that, than what the outside. What's inside you matters, you know, uh, the, than, than what's the outside. You know, what's in your heart, what you think, what you feel. It's more important than the clothes you're wearing or how you keep yourself, or how you groom yourself. Those things are more important. But that's not to say that those things don't matter, because they do. Right. And, you know, if appearance doesn't matter, then explain to me why 1 Corinthians 11, the first half of it, is about hair length. If appearance doesn't matter, why does God get down to, the, to the, just, women should have long hair and men should have short hair. Why does God get that specific? I mean, isn't that pretty specific about your, about your appearance, how to wear your hair? Exactly. I mean, God gets after your hair how long or short it should be, depending on whether or not you're a man or a woman. I mean, so obviously the outside appearance matters. If it doesn't matter, why does God go on in 1 Timothy chapter 2 about modest apparel? About how women shouldn't, you know, uh, wear things that are just exorbitantly expensive and just draw attention to themselves. That they should, they should, you know, not draw attention, whether it be through revealing, you know, scantily clad clothing or just wearing very expensive garments and things like that. Why, if, if the outside appearance doesn't matter, why is that there? Right. If the outside appearance doesn't matter, then why do we have Deuteronomy chapter 25? You know, why do we? Why does God say that a, a man should not put on a, a woman's garment, and that a woman should not wear that which pertaineth unto a man? Why is God concerned about what clothes we're wearing? Because appearance matters. Because yep. the way you look matters. But what also matters is what's inside. And here's the thing: what's what inside always will eventually come out on the outside. <clears throat> See, it's a matter of priority, not propriety. It's not a matter of what's proper and what isn't. It's a matter of priority. What's more important? What's more important is what's inside. That's not to say what's outside doesn't matter. You know, we should care about the way we look mm -hmm. and the way we dress. And that's just something I wanted to touch on. Now, in verse 27, he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are likened unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and all of cleanness. Even so ye outwardly appear righteousness, uh, righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. And say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves, that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the, can the, condemnation, the damnation of hell? I mean, <laughs> this is one of the hardest, sermons. this is some of the hardest preaching you'll ever find. That's right. And it's Jesus preaching it. Amen. I mean, I, I couldn't even come close to preaching this. You know, getting up in front of the people that you know are just guilty of all these things and just calling them out in front of everybody and just laying it to them the way he's doing it. It's, it's really good. And he goes on and says, uh, Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them ye shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel, even of the blood of Zacharias, the son of Archias, whom ye slew between the altar, the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto, thee, unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. I mean, no doubt about it, Jesus was a hard preacher. Yeah. And people today have this just Man. weird, twisted up view of who Jesus was. That Jesus was just this gentle little lamb that wouldn't hurt anybody or say anything negative. 
You have you not read? Yeah. You know, go read just just read Matthew 23. That's right. And tell me Jesus wasn't a hard face ripping preacher. Amen. Now he is angry in this chapter, no doubt about it. I mean, he's mad and with good reason. And we see Jesus getting angry. A lot of people that are say, well, you know, being angry is sin. That's not true. Right. You know, it's, it's it, you know, why are you angry? You know, be not soon angry. You know, but there is a time to be angry. And this is Jesus being angry. And for good reason. You know, he doesn't just get angry at the drop of a hat. You know, we should try to control our temper. But, I mean, we have to remember this is later in his ministry. Jesus has been putting up with these guys for a long time. He's been giving them a lot of signs. He's giving them a lot of preaching. A lot of them got gotten saved. A lot of them have come over to his side. But, you know, others are, are, are not. And so finally, he's, you know, towards the end of his ministry, he's starting to deal with these guys a little bit more seriously. But we can't forget the fact, and it kind of shows us here in verse 37, that Jesus has had a burden for these people for a very long time. I mean, he's God. I mean, he's, he's been burdened for the house, the children of Israel, you know, since the day he led them out of, out of Egypt. He's, he's wanted them to do right, to be right, so that, to be his people, so that he could be their God. I mean, that's what he says here in verse 37. After all that hard preaching, just face ripping, you know, kind of ends it with this, this very mournful and just sentimental and just, you can see his heart where it's really at. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thee to uh, gather thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings. He's saying, look, I wanted you to come back to me. I yep. wanted you to receive me. I wanted to gather you as a, as a mother hen gathers her chicks. I mean, it's such a, you know, that's just the, 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 that illustration is just so nurturing and, and kind and loving. All the things that, that are in his heart. But what's the problem? And ye would not. You know, why does God get so angry with these people eventually? Because they would not. Because God, get, they give God reason to get angry. That's what we see a lot. That people are getting, that Jesus gets upset with people because of the fact of what they have done. You know, and there's a time and place for God to get angry. And a lot of times, uh, you know, in fact, almost every instance, it's because of the fact it's something that we have done. You know, and that's what we see here. And what we can understand from this is that. You know, God is very long-suffering. The Bible says in Psalm 145, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion. The Bible says he is slow to anger and of great mercy. And that's true about God. And he's probably more gracious and more full of compassion than any of us can even understand. But the fact is, is that God has a limit with his compassion. He has a limit with his patience with people. And, you know, I don't want to find out where that is in my own life. I, that, that, that's frightening. And people do that in their life. Oh, let's see how far I can push God. See what I can get away with. You know, do you really want to find out where that line is? No. Where God goes from being merciful, patient, kind, to where now he's just going to deal with you? That's not something I want. <laughs> you know, God's graciousness, God's compassion, God's patience is reserved for those who appreciate it. You know, people who understand that about God and don't try to push it, they're the ones that benefit from God's um, grace and mercy. You know, but here's the thing. People that don't appreciate it, people that do push it, like these scribes and Pharisees who had all the works, all these works done in front of them. I mean, they had the Lord himself standing in front of them. I mean, it's just amazing anybody that could have denied Jesus Christ was, was, was God at that time, that he was the Messiah, that he was the Christ that they were looking for. I mean, the things that he did. You know, no man can do these things except God be with him. Right. No, no man ever spake like this man spake. Mm -hmm. I mean, if all, if all the things that me, Ben, to see and do were were to be written in a book, the world itself could not contain them. The volumes that would be written. I mean, the things that he did, but yet, here we have a group of people who didn't believe. They rejected him. Why? Because they had their own selfish motives. Because they didn't want to give up you know, the praise of men. They didn't want to give up. They were afraid. They were envious of his popularity and of his power and his ability. So they pushed it with God, and as a result, he comes down on them, you know, and he deals with them. And what's the result there? Verse 38, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. That's not what I want to hear coming out of the mouth of God. I mean, that's, that's a frightening thought. I mean, and, and they're, they're, they're thinking, what is he talking about? You know, we're, they're a thriving nation. They have, their, they have their temple. They're doing fine. Everything's good. And he says, no, your house is desolate. You know, it's going to be, it's going to be laid down. It's going to be laid low. God's going to bring every, every stone down. They're not one stone shall be left upon another. We'll see more of that next week. But, you know, God, God's, 
mercy and grace is there, but it's reserved for those who appreciate it. And let me tell you, it has a limit. And that's what we see here in this chapter. People that have pushed God too far, and it, it's not that he was without, not, it's not that he didn't have compassion with them, it's just that that ran out. You know, if, if people don't respond to it at a certain time, finally God just says, okay, and, it, and deals with them right. and, uh, otherwise. So let's not that be us, you know. I know we're not, you know, if we're in here, we're saved. We're never going to turn into reprobate false prophets because we have the Holy Spirit in us. But let's just remember that even as God's children, you know, we don't want to push the envelope with God and see how far or what we can get away with because it might just be that, you know, it's not as, we can't push God as far as we think, and, and then we're going to be really hurting. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer.